My name is Liz Erlewine, and I'm going to go Arts Director here for the Tree Arts Center, and welcome to Talking Pets. Bobby Atkin is the series at Perfect Tree Arts Center host in Potosi. We all have Bobby Atkin from Carver City. I was just talking with someone who was mentioning our Carver City location, so I wanted to plug for that as well. I'm going to go all locations. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> Um, so they don't do quite weekly, but they have um, quite a few presentations that they do throughout the run of their exhibitions. And so the the, the goal behind Hobby at Penn is community, uh, art, conversation, uh, to bring people together to talk about ideas that relate to things going on in our community and going on in the arts in our region as they affect us. Um, and so it's really great to have um, our guest presenters and you here to um, to just engage with this content and have these conversations. Uh, this program is made possible thanks to our members. So, Green Hill Free Arts Center members help sustain our organization and allow us to put on free programs and, and host the exhibitions that you see on display here. So, a big thank you to our members. If you are not yet a Perfect Tree Arts Center member, you can see Bobby at the front desk for more information and find out about whether that's a good person. Mm -hmm. uh, this program here in Kentucky is also made possible thanks to Roast and Toast. So, it seems that people have some coffee in the pastry. Mm -hmm. So, that's fantastic. Uh, they uh, they are a great service in our community. We love Rust and Post, and uh, big shout out to them for making this video. Uh, this series of uh, Copy at 10 here in Potosky are largely connected to the exhibition that we are currently sitting within, which is called Art, Place, and Community 10 Years with Good Heart Artist Residency. Good Heart Artist Residency is located in the north of Good Heart, Michigan, and they support and foster artists uh, in their creative practice and supporting visual artists, writers, and composers. And so for the past 10 years, they have welcomed um, over 80 artists to their space to sink into their creative practice and connect with our community. Art, place, and community are um, the pillars that they stand by. And so, of course, we're surrounded by some amazing artwork. Uh, by alumni artists who have been through that program. Um, during their time at Good Heart, they also are encouraged and um, they're given ways to connect with uh, the place of Northern Michigan and really connect with our past, our present, and the natural environment and the community in which we serve. And um, they also are, when, when artists are at Good Heart, they are charged with doing a community program of some kind. Often this is an artist talk here at Perfect Tree. They have done uh, projects and programs with nonprofit organizations and schools throughout the region, um, bringing these artists into the community to really get a chance to engage with uh, the folks who live here year round. Uh, so it's a really great program and we're really excited about this exhibition. So, so these copy at 10 to, uh, largely the series are connected to those ideas uh, and often directly connected to the exhibition. And so today's guest is Danny Knopf Davis. Um, whose work are behind us, so we can see her original works behind us. Um, but today she's going to tell us about her creative practice. Uh, Danny is no stranger to Cricketry Arts Center. We've been just talking about how long she's been involved with the organization in it. So it's a vicinity of five years. Uh, Danny's work can be found in our sales gallery. Um, so often we uh, have her productions and prints of her beautiful illustration. So this is a true treat to be able to see the originals on display. So I'm really grateful for your participation in this exhibition. Uh, and with that, I'm just going to ask you to join me in welcoming Danny as she shares with us about her work. Thank you. All right, thanks for coming this morning. Um, it's really uh, special to be here and thanks to Crooked Tree for hosting this and to Bill and Sue. Um, you'll hear about them throughout the presentation. So I wanted to start with a reading from a Sand County Almanac uh, by Eldo Leopold. It was first published in 1949. I imagine some of you have probably read this book because it's been around a while. Um, so in the foreword it begins, there are some who can live without wild things and some who cannot. These essays are the delights and dilemmas of one who cannot. So I'm going to skip forward to September. Um, and so just, uh, there's some language in here that's, that's pretty old. So uh, for reference, a copse is a small grouping of trees and a covey is a small flock of birds, um, usually associated with quail. The coral copse, by September, the day breaks with little help from birds. A song sparrow may give a single half-hearted song 
A woodcock may twitter overhead en route to his daytime thicket. A barred owl may terminate the night's argument with one last wavering call. But few other birds have anything to say or sing about. It is on some, but not all, of these misty autumn daybreaks that one may hear the chorus of the quail. The silence is suddenly broken by a dozen contralto voices, no longer able to restrain their praise of the day to come. After a brief minute or two, the music closes as suddenly as it began. There is a peculiar virtue in the music of elusive birds. Songsters that sing from topmost boughs are easily seen and as easily forgotten. They have the mediocrity of the obvious. I would beg to differ, but one, what one remembers is the invisible hermit thrush pouring silver chords from impenetrable shadows. The soaring crane trumpeting from behind a cloud. The prairie chicken booming from the mists of nowhere. The quails Ava Maria in the hush of dawn. No naturalist has ever seen the choral act for the covey is still on its invisible roost in the grass, and any attempt to approach automatically induces silence. In June, it is completely predictable that the robin will give voice when the light intensity reaches 0 0.01 candle power, and that the bedlam of other singers will follow in predictable sequence. In autumn, on the other hand, the robin is silent and it is quite unpredictable whether the Covey chorus will occur at all. The disappointment I feel on these mornings of silence perhaps shows that things hoped for have a higher value than things assured. The hope of hearing quail is worth half a dozen risings in the dark. My farm always has one or more coveys in autumn, but the daybreak chorus is usually distant. I think this is because the coveys prefer to roost as far as possible from the dog, whose interest in quail is even more ardent than my own. One October dawn, however, as I sat sipping coffee by the outdoor fire, a chorus burst into song, hardly a stone's throw away. They had roosted under a white pine copse, possibly to stay dry during the heavy dew. We felt honored by this daybreak hymn, sung almost at our doorstep. Somehow the blue autumnal needles on those pines became thenceforth bluer and the red carpet of dewberry under those pines became even redder. Um, so my work uh, kind of begins with something like this. And I imagine a lot of you are here for the same reason. You know, we live in Northern Michigan because of the natural resources, because of the wild and the water, uh, the birds, the fish. And um, so for about 10 years now, I've been um, learning about wildlife here. And I've found that not only has it given me a, a greater understanding of this place, but it's also connected me with people in the community um, uh, that are also kind of after the same thing. And, um, I first started by illustrating fish. I wanted to learn about fish. Uh, when I was a little girl, I loved just going out and looking for the bass and the bluegill and the perch. And uh, eventually over time, I, I wanted to learn more about the relationships of these wild things as they exist together up here. So my most recent body of work um, is diving deeper into the ecology. And uh, I thought it would be nice just to share a definition of ecology from the Ecological Society of America. Ecology is the study of the relationships between living organisms. It seeks to understand the vital connections between plants and animals and the world around them. Ecology also provides information about the benefits of ecosystems and how we can use Earth's resources in ways that leave the environment healthy for future generations. Um, so, when I first arrived at uh, the Goodhart Artist Residency, this was 2019. It was probably the worst year of my life. I was um, going through a divorce that was really kind of unforeseen. And uh, I had some other stuff going on that was just really difficult for me. And I, I almost thought about not even going to the residency, um, but I kept talking to myself saying, you need to go, you need to go. This is gonna be good for you, you know? So I showed up there with this, this painted turtle and uh, it was a work in progress at the time. And I had recently started to become more interested in butterflies and um, their transformation. And 
and uh, and also threatened flower species in Michigan. So I showed up with this list of three flowers um, that are threatened in Michigan. And I didn't know Sue had worked for the Department of Natural Resources. <laughs> so immediately um, we had a lot to talk about in terms of you know wildlife and and um, and, and plants. So she knew right where to go to look for these three flower species. And um, so this is a shot of Sturgeon Bay. Has anybody ever been up there? Yeah, it's such a special place. Um, so the first flower on the list was pitcher's thistle. And it is a species of flower that only grows on the Great Lakes shoreline in the sand dunes. Um, it's really beautiful. And so Sue and Bill took, us, took me right to the spot to find them. And uh, here's a young one. Um, so this species, it takes at least five years to flower, um, which is maybe part of the reason why it's having a difficult time. As we all know, the Great Lakes shoreline has become very desirable and we have a lot of development happening. Um, so that's one reason why it's become threatened. But anyways, we walked back into these dunes and, and they were all around us and it really felt quite magical the way the light was coming through. and. Um, Here's kind of a side shot. They're this really beautiful kind of teal, blue, green color. And they have this uh, kind of white woolly threading um, on the foliage. And um, I took some photos, but Bill took the best photo. <laughs> so this is a photo Bill sent to me and I was just so taken by this photo and how beautiful it was. So here you can see what the flower looks like. So um, I met with Derek Shields and he works for Little Traverse Conservancy and he is just a wealth of knowledge. And he told me about um, this website called iNaturalist. And um, if you haven't heard about it, basically it's, it's a platform that you can set up an account in and you can go out into nature and take a photograph of a species and then you can pin it uh, where it's located um, and other people can kind of access the data. So here I'm in iNaturalist and I search for pitcher's thistle and all of those little um, pinpoints are people who have, who have found pitcher's thistle and kind of you know, tagged it. Um, and then on the right here, you can see the, the different uh, tags here from people. And um, it's just, it's quite compelling uh, seeing the range, you know, produced by so many people that are just interested, you know, and passionate about, about um, conservation. So yeah, a couple interesting facts. Um, pitcher thistle, the taproot can grow up to six feet uh, long. So it can go really deep into the earth and it flowers uh, June through September. And it is currently listed as a threatened species in Michigan. Um, so when I was going through these, these observations, I, I naturalist one um, up in the Harbor Springs area kind of caught my attention because there was a caterpillar on it in this kind of strange silk tent. And so um, I reached out to my friend James, who is a naturalist at the Grass River Natural Area. And he put this book together, which um, it's a field guide to Northwest Michigan. It's such a great resource and I use it all the time. Um, and so I said, James, like, do you think you could recognize what this caterpillar is? And he said, well, I think it's a, an American lady. And so I started to learn about the American lady butterfly. Um, Here's a, a drawing shot. Uh, it was quite a struggle, <laughs> this one. <laughs> Just getting, you know, um, this part was particularly difficult because there's a sequence of Fibonacci going on here. Um, yeah, I really struggled to get that right. But so here you can start to see the, uh, the life cycle of the American lady butterfly. Um, the chrysalis is hanging off of the bottom of the plant there. And then you can see what the caterpillar looks like on the side. And then the butterfly, which is a, a pollinator of this species. And here it is in the studio being painted. And I must have put at least a hundred layers on um, <laughs> the flower just to get the pinks to, to come through. 
There's another species of butterfly that looks like the American lady. It's called the painted lady. And the, the main difference is um, you can see on that the hind wing there, there's there's two spots. One is kind of covered up um, underneath, but uh, the, the American lady has two big eye spots. And um, if you're ever close enough, the painted lady has four smaller ones. And there's the finished piece. Um, I, I derive a lot of inspiration from natural history artists. So um, around this time, I was learning a lot about uh, Maria Sibylla Marion. She was one of the first women to study metamorphosis um, scientifically. And il her illustrations are so beautiful. Um, and she was doing it, I mean, just when people, you know, didn't believe that this could even happen, you know. Um, So yeah, here's, here's when I searched American Lady and I Naturalist, you can see its range where uh, people have recorded. It's, it's very common all over our continent. They overwinter as a chrysalis and they're a little smaller than a monarch. Um, their flight period here is May through October. And uh, some of their food sources are pearly everlasting, burdock, asters. So actually the pitcher sisal is in the aster family. Uh, milkweed, goldenrod, choke cherry, and lilac. And here you can kind of see what it looks like uh, when its wings are open, which is vastly different, you know, from the, the other side of its wing. So flash forward to this year, um, I did do a series of butterflies and like you can see my monarch um, here. Uh, I raise monarchs now, I know a lot of people do and it's pretty, pretty exciting to meet folks at art shows who do that. I mean, I've met some people who have raised hundreds like in a season, it's pretty wild. <laughs> I'm lucky if I get seven or 10, but um, so I've transitioned this year into learning more about birds and um, the ecology of birds. And uh, of course, I've looked a lot at Audubon's work and um, Louis Agassiz Fuertes, who's probably my favorite bird artist, uh, Maria Martin. Um, people don't know this, but um, did anybody see the NPR article about the extinct species yesterday? Well, the illustration on that article is um, by Maria Martin, but it was in Audubon's book. And you know she just didn't get credit, um, which was kind of a bummer. But it's a really beautiful illustration. So I spent uh, the winter learning about birds, and this is actually a day on the Osabo River, real early this spring. Those are some um, trumpeter swans that we saw. So uh, the Kirtland's warbler um, has a story, which I'm sure many of you know, but it was listed. Uh, as an endangered species in um, 1973, I believe. Uh, but basically, the species was almost extinct in Michigan um, for a few reasons. It exclusively nests in jack pine forests and uh, it nests on the ground. Um, and as, as you know, Michigan was heavily logged um, in the late 1800s and into the early 1900s, so a lot of habitat was taken out around that time. A uh, couple of things about jack pine that make it really interesting. The pine cones need wildfire to open up and to reproduce. So, so that's kind of a, a difficulty when it comes to regeneration. Um, but anyways, this species was listed as uh, endangered and I would say it's one of the first species that the government really rallied around and put funding toward and um, reached out to various partners and they came up with a Kirtland's warbler recovery plan. And this involved a lot of planting jack pine seedlings and forest management. And it was really kind of a pivotal era for conservation in Michigan, especially because people in the government were really coming together to, um, to value species conservation. So when you search Kirtland Warbler um, and iNaturalist, this is what comes up, it's pretty sparse. Uh, the, so this bird, it, it's bro it's broods and breeding season it happens in Michigan, uh, parts of Ontario and Wisconsin. But because it's so specific about the habitat it breeds and nests in, um, it's, it's, uh, 
it's just, it's difficult, you know, to, to regenerate when your habitat has been degraded so much. Um, it was delisted in 2019 uh, from the endangered species list, which is pretty exciting. So they are recovering pretty well, um, thanks to all of these different partnerships and conservation programs, uh, in large part in Michigan. Um, so that's good news. But if anybody wants to learn more about it, uh, the Kirtland's Warbler Alliance has a, a pretty informative website. Uh, this bird, they spend a winter in the Bahamas. So that's why you're seeing some um, pins show up down, down in the Bahamas there. And uh, an so another thing that really worked against the Kirtlands um, was the brown-headed cowbird. Uh, there's something called nest parasitism. So basically the species of bird quite evil, <laughs> will go to different nests and lay its eggs and then leave them, you know, leave them to uh, be raised by another species. So uh, a good girlfriend of mine actually worked um, for the Kirtland's recovery. This would have been, I don't know, 15 years ago. She was in the grayling area and her job was to go out and kill brown-headed uh -huh. cowbirds. And she had very mixed feelings about it, but she did it, you know? Um, and literally they were just like squashing them. So, yeah, that, that's a thing that happens. Um, so what I started doing was finding different photos uh, from observations on iNaturalist that I just thought were just beautiful and composing them digitally. And what I would do is I would find, I don't know, like a dozen photos and then pull them out and in my mind start to put a composition together. And then I'd go into Photoshop and I'd erase all the parts I didn't want and keep the parts I did want and then start to put the whole thing together. So, so this is the original composition um, that I created from uh, several photos that I pulled from my naturalist. And each number represents a different uh, picture. And then to add interest and really to, to I don't know, um, dive into the ecology a little bit more, I thought it would be kind of fun to learn about some of the insects um, that also rely on, uh, well, in this case, the jack pine. So, so here you're seeing jack pine, and um, it shows uh, kind of the life cycle of the pine cone. So you have a young pine cone here. You have one that's been opened by wildfire here. And then uh, when you're out in the woods trying to identify jack pine, it, is, it looks a little bit like scrubbier. And if you look at uh, the branches more closely, there's two needles that come out of each one of the little, uh, I don't know what you would call it, but out of the branches. And then here I, I added in, this is the Eastern pine elfin. It's a really tiny butterfly that um, lays its eggs on jack pine and feeds on jack pine as a caterpillar. And then up here, um, number seven, that's the purplish gray moth. Uh, and they also feed on jack pine as well. Um, I have an iPhone seven, so my process shots are not the best. I probably need to upgrade. Uh, but here's a, a work in progress of the Kirtland warbler, just getting into the painting part. And then here's the, the finished illustration. And then in the man, manner of natural history, I, I um, have my work photographed uh, by Scott Wilson in Traverse City. He's just phenomenal. And then um, I add the text uh, on my computer afterwards before the prints are made. Bless you. So the next piece I'm gonna talk about is the rough grouse um, and that painting, the original is hanging on that wall. So the rough grouse is uh, the most popular game bird in our country. Uh, a lot of uh, bird hunters, this is what they're after and they do taste quite good. I eat it a lot. My boyfriend is an avid bird hunter. <laughs> we had grouse on Monday night for dinner. Um, and they're doing pretty well. Uh, so they, they are not a species of concern. So in iNaturalist, when you search ruffed grouse, this is what comes up. You can see it's, it's reported all over the northern part of our continent. Um, they're a year-round Michigan resident. And in the winter, um, they have a funny feature. They actually uh, grow little combs off of the side of their, their feet. And um, scientists believe it's kind of like a snowshoe. And then they lose it in the spring. Um, wow. They'll burrow themselves in big snowdrifts in the winter to, to keep warm. And then 
surely you have all heard them, um, especially in the spring when uh, they're drumming. So they'll find a log and um, they're called drumming logs. Usually it'll be like an old kind of moss covered chunk of log and they'll get up on it and um, they will move their wings in a way that sounds like, like, a, like a tractor starting up. And uh, I think a lot of people think that's what it is. They, they don't realize it's a bird, um, but the sound can carry up to a quarter of a mile, which is pretty impressive. And you can feel it. it's like a vibration coming out of the ground. It's, it's really impressive. Um, so their breeding habitat are young aspen stands. Uh, Aspen is so critical to this species and aspen, quaking aspen in particular is really prevalent all across our country. So that's, that's another reason why their range is so great. Um, they eat the buds, the catkins and the leaves of aspen, um, but there are a variety of other tree species they rely on. Um, in the first two weeks of their lives, they rely heavily on insects and that's common with a lot of bird species just uh, to have a lot of protein when they're really young to build strength. Um, so this one I pulled, let's see, 11, yeah, 11 different photos from my naturalists to create this composition. And uh, so you can see this one down here is a male and um, they call it the rough grouse for these kind of beautiful black feathers that puff up um, when they're showing off. And uh, this is a female rough grouse up here. It's really hard to tell the difference between the male and the female. Um, the difference is actually on the, the, uh, fan of the tail here. And so it's these, just these middle two feathers here where you can tell the difference between the male and the female. Um, I chose to illustrate a uh, black hawthorn uh, in this one. Black hawthorn in Michigan, it's more found along the Lake, Lake Superior shoreline up in the UP. But we have at least several species of hawthorn in the state of Michigan that are all over the state. And um, I tried to show it so you could see what it looks like in the spring. So up top, you can see the flowering buds of the hawthorn and what the flower would look like. And then down here, you can see what the berries would look like in the fall. They almost look like blueberries. And uh, so I discovered in the process that the, the white admiral butterfly also feeds on hawthorns. So you can see the whole life cycle of the, the white admiral in this um, composition. So here's the chrysalis. Um, some butterflies, their chrysalis actually mimic bird droppings, mm -hmm. and some really do look like bird droppings, so you wouldn't notice them. Um, and then here's the, the caterpillar kind of crawling up that way. And yeah, we saw a few of them in uh, Crawford County in Lewiston this summer, but I don't see them much. I live in Boyne. I haven't seen any in the Boyne area. So here's a process shot of the drawing. I almost lost my mind drawing this one. There was just a lot going on. Um, and then here's the finished piece as a print. And then lastly, um, just to talk a bit about process. How are we doing on time? Does anybody have the time? Lots of time? Okay. So uh, this was the first bird actually that I illustrated this winter. I thought the cedar waxwings would be a little bit easier because all of their you know, definition, is they're just so well-defined, their features, whereas the grouse was very challenging, especially the tail feathers. So um, cedar waxwings are one of my favorite birds and um, they're fairly common. Although at shows this summer, I talked to a lot of folks who said they just didn't see as many this year as they usually do. Um, if you have berries uh, in your, your yard, service berry, um, winter berry, they're likely to show up and, and feed on them. And they'll, when they show up, I feel like they always come in dramatically. It'll be like a flock of them that kind of swoop in and um, kind of fill up the tree. And they're just, I don't know, they're so fun. So anyways, this is uh, an illustration of winter berry. Some people call it Michigan holly. And then um, here we can see what the flowers look like in the spring. And then up top, what the berries look like in the fall. And uh, the cedar waxwing, they eat the most fruit out of any birds out there. A um, couple interesting things about them. So the one that's up top there, the little bits of red, those are actually like little waxy 
tips that they grow as they age. Mm. And the males um, that have the most seem to be the most sought after by the females. So <laughs> the ladies like the, the wax. And um, they, they both do a lot of work when it comes to raising the young. Uh, it's definitely a, you know, a strong partnership there. And um, so to talk a bit about process. So I'm a watercolor artist and I have several uh, trays like this in my studio. When I get, when I get started painting on a, a species, um, I test all the colors out on a piece of paper because with watercolor, it's very deceiving what it looks like dried that, uh, what, because the, the sediments and the pigment um, will settle out as it dries. So you gotta get these wet and really mix them up and test them on paper to figure out what it truly looks like. So um, I brought in, I call these palettes. Um, so when I was creating this composition, um, you can kind of see uh, here I am like testing different colors and, and adjusting them and I'll pass this around so you can kind of see, but um, I also on these plastic palettes code them with numbers or letters because it would be impossible for me to remember, you know, what I was working with uh, the day before. So that has been uh, become a really important part of my process. And if you are into watercolor painting and you do want to work on a piece for an extended period of time, I would highly recommend doing that for your own sanity. Um, so you don't have to remember things as much, but yeah, I'll pass that around. So I do that with every, what? I use Windsor Newton and Grumbacher. Um, they're just super high quality and they've, they've been around for a very long time. Um, I actually, I work with really small brushes too. The big ones kind of scare me, which I know is kind of the opposite for most watercolor artists. Um, so yeah, a lot of my brushes are, are really small. When you draw the lines, does that mean you did not end up using that? Or it, it means I adjusted it. So yeah. Yeah, so that's just a little uh, view into uh, how I, I find my colors for each piece. Um, and often I'll work on, like with the birds especially, I would work on just the birds for a time. And then I'd work on just like the foliage for a time or just the nest, because it just helps me to keep my palette kind of under control. Um, so, yeah. Do they stay here year long? Or they flip them? So I think some of them do, but I think most of them leave. Yeah, I've definitely seen some in the winter. So here are some resources. Um, you could take a picture of this if, if you want to take some of these resources home with you. Uh, iNaturalist.org, which I talked about quite a bit. Um, they just received nonprofit status, which is really exciting. So that'll help them um, acquire some funding to grow. Allaboutbirds.org is another great resource if you want to look up different species of birds and just learn about them. And we're going to see a couple of videos at the end here uh, on that website. And um, this book was recommended to me by my, my girlfriend who, the cowbird killer. <laughs> uh, she's an avid birder. This is an old one, but uh, it's a really great comprehensive book of the breeding birds of Michigan. And you get um, really nice descriptions. There's not any color, which is kind of a bummer, but you get really nice descriptions of the birds and then, um, you know, their breeding ranges. So here you can see how specific the Kirtland Warbler breeding range is. So when you're in the grayling area though, and if any of you are ever over there and wanna um, see a Kirtland Warbler, Hartwick Pines uh, does tours in, I think it's May and June. And um, they keep the group small uh, and there's a really great chance that you're gonna see them when you go out with that, that tour. Hartwick Pine. Pine, so H-A-R-T-W-I-C-K. And then also um, up in the Sini uh, Wildlife Refuge in the Upper Peninsula, so when you go over the bridge and then you kind of keep going north but cut inland to the middle part of the UP, there is a Kirtland's uh, refuge there now too. And they're redoing their visitor center. It's going to be awesome. Um, and uh, I believe you could go out and probably find some Kirtlands there too uh, next spring when they're breeding. Um, and then another book that has been really useful uh, is called The Butterflies of the Northwoods by Larry Weber. So that is this book. 
And um, I use this a lot when I'm trying to learn about different species I see for caterpillars. Um, you don't get the caterpillar in this book, which kind of bums me out because, and it's just hard, you know, there aren't many resources out there when you're finding a caterpillar to be able to easily identify what the butterfly is. Um, so, so hopefully somebody will come along and take on that challenging task. With the Kirtland, yeah, with an S on the end, Kirtland's refuge. Um, Kirtland's, yeah, wildlife refuge. It's in the Sini, um, Sini Wildlife Park. I can't remember what the proper name is, but Sini is S E N E Y. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I just want to say thanks to Sue and Bill for the opportunity to kind of kickstart my ecological illustrations. It was a really special beginning. Yeah, and um, I think there'll be more to come. So, uh, and Cricket Tree Art Center again, super grateful to them and, and Little Traverse Conservancy. Um, I hike their trails a lot. And so they play such a major role in just like preserving the habitat, you know, and we don't often hear about that side of their work because they're always trying to like promote their services, you know, these great trails and you can hunt here. But what they do is so important for wildlife. Um, and making sure the species have a place to return or live. My son just started volunteering every Thursday. He's a sophomore in high school. Nice. And uh, he's been doing gravel. He's been pulling vines, invasive vines. Yeah. Carpentry. And, and, and uh, they're, it's a lot of fun. They love volunteers. And they have a lot of fun doing it. And yeah. A blast every Thursday. He does it now them. Yeah. Such a great organization. And, and exciting news, they just acquired a huge parcel of land up uh, in Bayshore um, that was a piece of real estate, you know, that, that was listed. And so that'll be another um, great place that we can go to and, and experience Lake Michigan and hike some new trails. Yeah. The video. What's next for you? What's next for me? Um, I'm going to do a few more birds for sure. I, I think the cardinal is going to be next. It's not in stone, but um, I had a pair of cardinals in my yard this spring that I just really enjoyed watching. And they, they had a nest nearby. I was a little scared because I have two cats, <laughs> um, but the cats didn't get them, thank God. And uh, they're, they're a beautiful bird. I think they have a lot of meaning for a lot of people in Michigan, um, as well as, I mean, we, we are a state of birds. We love our birds, right? The robin, the loon, uh, there's so many. Um, so I think the cardinals next, and I'm not sure. I love orioles and tanagers too. Um, so they'll probably be songbirds, but don't quote me. Because sometimes I say things and then I'm like, oh, but I want to do this next. So we'll see. But it will be birds and, uh, and more ecology for a little while. And then I'm not sure what's after that. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So I've got like an annual schedule now. So um, I, I give myself November to take a break because I do a lot of shows in the summer and I'm just, I'm so worn out in the summer. But um, so I take November to just like, you know, regenerate and do some family time. And then in December is when I start getting serious about what bird I'm going to do next and um, learning about different species and pulling photographs. And then it takes me about, um, I would say like two weeks to like put the composition together digitally, like I showed those slides. And I, I will spend, on each of these birds, I, I spent probably about a month on the drawing. And for me, that's like three hours every morning. Um, so I wake up and the first thing I do is I go and sit down at my desk and start drawing. And I find that three hours is a good time frame because if I start to do more, I just start screwing things up, you know, um, painting too. So I think, you know, you got to find what works for you. Um, but as we all know, our concentration and our focus is limited. So um, yeah, for me, I'm an, I'm an early bird. So yeah, and then I paint for at least, oh my gosh, the grouse took me, I think two months to paint. And the Kirtlands, probably a month and a half. I, to be honest, I could have worked a couple more weeks on the Kirtlands, but I was under a deadline. <laughs> so, um, yeah. 
so yeah it, it's it's reasonable to think like i'll get three final like pieces finished in the winter and then show season starts like around may and that's when i'll i'll just put all my painting supplies away and i'll just go to shows and be a saleswoman you know so yeah what is your what what uh, weight water paper do you use i use really heavy stuff yeah like the heaviest like that, yeah. but i've learned that you really have to work like you really have to work the really thick papers and water so you soak that paper and then you flatten it um and you like so you should leave it overnight compressed between like two heavy objects wet. yeah yeah wet like i'll put wax paper over the wet paper and then i'll put like plywood board on top and then like all my books you know and leave it there overnight the thing that happens with watercolor paper is that you know it's made up of all these little cotton fibers so when you get um a certain part of it like say super saturated wet uh it disproportionately you know uh, wants to pull on the paper. So it's it's often that you'll see like some watercolor illustrations are bending a little bit. Um, and that's just the paper acting naturally. But so like the way I frame these pieces, it's called a float mount. And you'll see that a lot with watercolor paintings because it's it's allowing the paint or the paper to kind of do its own thing. I would caution not putting it behind um, a mat because what will happen is um, you'll start to get like bubbling under the mat. And that's not, that's not with all, but like the bigger you go, the more you're gonna get run into that problem, so. So when you buy the, three, the heavy or stock of watercolor paper, it doesn't come, it's going. It looks like it's fine, you know, yeah, but so. yeah. So you soak it and you blot it with towels and then you press it with what, paper? I don't blot it with towels. I use a sponge, a dry sponge and you, you want to just kind of um, wick off the excess water with a sponge. Plastic on both sides. Yeah. For the paper and then you press it. Okay. With weight. Yeah. And there's a lot of videos on how to do it. Um, yeah. Yeah. You don't want to have to learn the hard way with that. Yeah. So Margaret's question is, do you think you provide workshops? That was, I think Margaret was playing that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So I usually do like two or three a year and um, yeah, I've done them at Jordan River Art Center in East Jordan and Glen Arbor and who knows, maybe here sometime down the road. So my website has been neglected. I, I will tell you, I am behind the times right now, but the, the birds will be on the website in the next couple of weeks and um, I'll do better about putting uh, workshops and stuff up there in the future. So, so. In Jordan, they would be the ones who would advertise saying you got a workshop. Yeah, yeah. And you're affiliated with the food society in Jordan. So. Oh, Glen Arbor. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. Being in curious, your, your originals are you can see on the wall, mm -hmm. but I so appreciate all of your reproduction work and seeing you at art shows and have me out and I buy your card all the time. It's fabulous. But um, I'm curious as to how much of your revenue as an artist comes from original or involved work you do with art shows and reproduction. Yeah, that's a good question. So I've been doing this professionally since 2017 and um, I've learned a lot. Um, I, I cannot rely on selling originals alone. It just would not work. Um, I don't think there are as many buyers for original art as there used to be. And I think in part that's because print reproduction has come such a long way. Yeah, the quality, the archival quality of a print. Um, so yeah, I, and then, you know, most of my revenue comes from print sales and cards. And um, that's why I do so many shows in the summer. And then I have a handful of shops that I work with, gift shops and, and you know, art centers like this that sell my work too. So it's been, it's been a learning process, uh, the business part. Um, but then it's like, there have been a couple of great shows where I sold a lot of originals, but those happen like once in a blue moon, you know? So, Who was your printer? Um, so if you guys want really high quality art prints, uh, Veda Color is in Traverse City, spelled V-A-D-A, -A, and Scott Wilson um, is the the brains there, and he is just a great guy. He's he's from Sutton's Bay, but he does a lot of um, the artists' reproductions that are well known in this area. 
they are museum quality. Also, he's done work for like the Pigeon River Discovery Center, you know, um, any gallery space that needs really high quality prints done for like historical exhibitions or huge photos um, on the wall. He does all that kind of stuff. So yeah, there's a good team there. Any other questions? Yeah. Yes. Um, so for me, it's really like a poetry. Um, I think poetry through words touches on things that just we can't communicate, you know, in our everyday language. Um, and painting is the same way for me as poetry is, I guess. It's, it's a way of communicating uh, a beauty about the natural world that just, it just can't be done with a camera, you know, or it can't be done with an essay. Um, and I think there's a lot to be said for, for not always looking to, to words to completely communicate what it is we're feeling. Um, and that's probably why there are artists. <laughs> uh, because we go to another place and to me, I guess it borders more on meditation um, and some form of transcendence but also reverence, you know, for a subject and the beauty of just wildness. I think it's also like primal, you know, I think it's, it's really deeply in our DNA and our genes from an evolutionary perspective, you know, it's, it's kind of crazy. If you just think like 150 years ago, you know, most of us had chickens then or cows, we were like doing all the things in a house. Um, to support and sustain ourselves and our neighbors and our communities. We were so much closer to the land then. And um, painting, I think, crystallizes, crystallizes kind of all of that in a way. Any other? Yeah. Yeah, so um, Liz and I have uh, two short um, snippets here. This is um, all about birds.org kind of quiet, but we're going to hear the Kirtland's call. Okay. Will you blow it up so it's big, Liz? Cool. Yeah, let's do it one more time. So that was a male. And the way you can tell the difference between a male and a female Kirtlands is around their eyes. The males don't have the darkness around their eyes. Um, Also, when it's breeding season for the Kirtland's warbler, they will often go to like the tops of the, the trees um, to call out and attract the females. Mm -hmm. Oh, and here we're going to see a video of a rough grouse drumming on a log. Yeah. yeah, you can see this is a big old log here, and this is actually what some of their scat looks like. Um, Kind of looks like rabbit food. <laughs> no, <I'm kidding. laughs> yeah. <laughs> Isn't that fun? 
that a mating call or is that just like the territorial yeah territorial yeah but yeah it also helps the females locate the males <laughs> clearly yeah <laughs> Yeah. Okay, so I want to leave you with a poem today. I'd like to end with a poem. Um, this uh, one is by Mary Oliver. She's a really well-known poet uh, who wrote a lot about nature. Not quite 4 a.m. When the rapture of being alive strikes me from sleep and I rise from the comfortable bed and go to another room where my books are lined up and they're neat and colorful rows. How magical they are. I choose one and open it up. Soon I have wandered in over the waves of the words to the temple of thought. And then I hear outside over the actual waves, the small perfect voice of the loon. He is also awake and with his heavy head uplifted, he calls out to the fading moon, to the pink flush swelling in the east that soon will become the long reasonable day. Inside the house, it is still dark, except for the pool of lamplight in which I am sitting. I do not close the book, neither for a long while do I read on. Thanks for coming. <laughs>